Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Alter Your Health podcast, your source of information and inspiration to promote the holistic transformation of your health and the health of our planet. I'm your host, Dr. Benjamin Alter. Nice to connect with you here today. If it's your first time coming through, welcome. Thanks for joining. And be sure to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast, this video on YouTube or wherever else you're tuning in from. I really appreciate that feedback. It really helps me grow and learn. That's my mission, that's my intention. And like I said, this is about information and inspiration because information alone doesn't do it. In fact, we have plenty of information in this world. I mean, overwhelming, bom- overwhelmingly bombarded with information on a moment to moment basis in our world today. And today's episode is yet more information, but hopefully in an inspirational kind of way. Our guest on the podcast today is Dr. Russell Jaffe, who is a wealth of knowledge. Have you ever met somebody and just had an initial interaction with somebody where they start talking and you realize, wow, this guy knows a lot, has experienced a lot, and has a lot to share? Well, that's Dr. Russell Jaffe. He knows a lot, has experienced a lot, and has a lot to share. While we could dive into nitty gritty details for hours and hours on end on any one number of any topic we could choose, the intention of this conversation was to be more broad in our overview of how we interface with environmental toxicants in our world today. So in this conversation, we talk about all of the things we might be exposed to, and more importantly, we talk about mitigating that exposure. And one thread that is kind of woven throughout this conversation is the fact that the body heals itself. And as we can just mitigate that exposure and naturally support the body in its ability to heal itself, we stay healthy and we thrive into our hundreds and beyond. So I'll go ahead and introduce our guest, Dr. Russell Jaffe, before we dive in. He, he is founder and chairman of PERC, Integrative Health LLC. PERC is P-E-R-Q-U-E dot com. It's a company that offers the world scientifically proven integrative health solutions to speed the transition from sick care to healthful caring. Dr. Jaffe has more than 40 years of experience contributing to molecular biology and clinical diagnostics. His focus is on functional predictive tests and procedures designed to improve the precision of both diagnosis and of treatment outcomes, and he has authored nearly 100 articles on the subject. He received his BS, MD, and PhD from the Boston University School of Medicine. He completed residency training in clinical chemistry at the National Institute for Health and remained on permanent senior staff before pursuing other interests, including starting the Health Studies Collegium think tank. Dr. Jaffe is board certified in clinical pathology and in chemical pathology. He is a recipient of the Merck, Sharp, and Dome Excellence and Research Award, the J.D. Lane Award, and the USPHS Meritorious Service Award. Dr. Jeff Jaffe was honored as an International Scientist of 2003 by the IBC Oxford, England, United Kingdom for his lifetime contributions to clinical medicine, biochemistry, immunology, methodology, and integrative health policy. He is widely published and and sought after to explain complex subjects to an audience. Dr. Jaffe is also founder and chairman of ELISA ACT Biotechnology and Magic Biotherapeutics. So you can learn more about Dr. Russell Jaffe, our guest, by visiting the show notes page, which is www.alter.health slash episode 88 would really appreciate any feedback pertaining to this conversation. I know I learned a lot by speaking with Dr. Russell Jaffe, so I encourage you to sit back, relax, and enjoy this one, maybe even with a pen and paper to take some notes. But um, don't be overwhelmed by the magnitude of information. I think it's important to just rest and just kind of let it wash over you and realize that the body is incredibly wise as, as it's able to interface with this crazy world that we're in today. 
Um, so without further ado, I'll stop blabbering and we can get into this great conversation with our guest, Dr. Russell Jaffe. Russell Jaffe, Dr. Jaffe, welcome to the Alter Your Health podcast. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for the invitation. I'm looking forward to yeah. the conversation. Absolutely. Well, I really do know that we could probably spend about two or three months talking and just barely scratch the surface in terms of what you know, what you've experienced, and what you can share with us. But we'll do our best to kind of fly over um, some pearls, like I was just saying, because uh, I think that you've got a lot for us in terms of keeping our heads above water in this crazy world. And one, one thing that I do know that you are quite knowledgeable in is environmental toxicants. And I think that might be a good place to start. Um, but before we dive in there, I would like to just ask you to maybe share a little bit of an introduction in terms of who you are and how you've come to focus on all the things you, you are focusing on in the holistic, integrative, functional medicine world today. Well, I trained in internal medicine and biochemistry at Boston University. I then, quote, matriculated to the National Institutes of Health, where I was doubly board certified in clinical pathology, chemical pathology, laboratory medicine, um, and stayed on the permanent senior staff um, until I met a Cambodian Buddhist monk whose name is Bhante Dharmawara. And this is the 20th anniversary of his passing at 110 years of age. And the last 30 years of his life, we largely stayed together. So I started as his acolyte, and then I became his physician. Um, and he traveled widely. At, a, at the age of 109, he had highest frequent flyer status of three different airlines. Wow. Uh, and was, in the common parlance, the real deal. So I came as a skeptic because in academic medicine, I did not learn anything about traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncture. And I went to debunk a man named Qing Wu and became his student, did a seven-year apprenticeship with him, and then taught a three-year cycle called Oriental Medical Strategies and Western Medical Practices, the first certification program for MDs and DOs uh, in acupuncture, five-element theory, yin-yang theory, but then the third year, you could take pulses the way a violinist plays a violin. It's an art, but if you have the art in your fingertips, which are very, very sensitive, and you have a lot of experience at feeling different, quote, pulses, you can actually get useful information about the major parts of a person just by feeling their pulse at the wrist. And you have to do both sides, but that's mm -hmm. core to TCM and com not completely, but almost completely <clears throat> foreign to my Western medical colleagues. We know about water hammer pulse. We know about certain extremes that you can feel in the pulse, and that's classical and conventional. So I came as a skeptic, and what I found was my ignorance, and I found people gracious enough to start with me as an acolyte, as a student, as their, um, the one who I learned from, and then, to my great good fortune and, 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 and uh, pleasant surprise, uh, I became their physician. And that's a different relationship because first I'm sitting at their feet learning their system and, and, the, and correcting my ignorance, if you will. And then at some point in time, they asked me to become the physician who guides them, who's supposed to know what's right for them. Now, it's a very special relationship, of course, but I'm privileged to say I had it with a number of people, including this fellow Bunty. And because of that transition, I left the place that I aspired to be. I wanted to be on the permanent senior staff of NIH and stay there until, you know, at 110 or 120, they finally mm -hmm. you know, found me at my desk uh, with my last breath. Um, <clears throat> but I left as a relatively young man having accomplished a certain amount, having left a certain record in the biomedical world. Um, and I decided to become first a student of, then a practitioner of, and now a mentor teacher of 
evoking human healing responses and not just diagnosing or treating disease. I think we all know that there's a spectrum and if the spectrum is a, it goes from one side to the other, the midpoint is the absence of disease, but the quality of your life, that is very different. You know, what strikes me is that, like you said, in your medical studies, you really didn't talk about healing. You didn't really talk about- No, <clears throat> no, in fact, it's, yeah. uh, today I think you talk about a person. In my day of training and as, uh, when I ran the residency program at the Clinical Center for Clinical Pathologists, we talked about the part of the person that was sick, the right. gallbladder in room X, Y, Z. <clears throat> but it was always a person. Yeah. Now, I did have the privilege in the late 1970s to help Norman Sheely and Paul Brenner and others found what's called the American Holistic Medical Association. And I believe that I'm the only person who has invited its core faculty for the first and the last, the 37th, uh, AHMA meeting. It's now morphed into a larger organization called AIHM. Uh, but it was my privilege to be there at the, at the birthing of the organization and to stay with it as an advocate um, through the decades. Amazing. Yeah, I've, I've been to the AIHM conference a couple of times, and it's a great group of people who are focused on health rather than disease. And that's what this conversation is certainly going to be focused on, health and staying healthy. And I think that, like I said, in terms of staying healthy in this world, we need to be aware of the factors that might come in the way, mainly environmental factors. So could you, uh, you know, speak a little bit to yep. the, the, the world of environmental toxicants and how, what, what we need to know the headlines are as follows. The headlines are as follows. Environmental toxicants consume, use up, deplete your essential nutrients. Now, essential nutrients are nutrients that your body has to take in because your body can't make them. That's why they're called essential. So the environmental toxins, of which there are five categories, and I will briefly talk about each of the five, mm. They are all pro-oxidants, that is, they use up antioxidants, they deplete beneficial minerals, they often contain toxic minerals or things like toxic, toxicants. Now, very important headline, 80% <clears throat> of your toxin environmental exposure is recent. 80% are things you can reduce, do a makeover in your kitchen, in your bathroom, and in your bedroom. What do I mean? I mean, for example, that in my kitchen, you'll see lots of whole foods and you'll see lots of traditional um, cooking implements, but almost no package and almost no processing and no edible oils. If you want to have insulin resistance, you do want to have insulin. You don't want to have insulin resistance. You want your insulin to be efficient. You, yes, you want your insulin to be sensitive. If you are like me, because I weighed 65 pounds more not too long ago, I was getting up to fluffy, to be frank. Um, if you want to restore insulin sensitivity, you must take in less than 20% of calories from fat. And when you separate the oil from the seed or the nut, there are lots of ways of cooking yummy, easy to prepare, but highly nutritious because they're nutrient dense and therefore pro repair. They're antioxidants because the pro-oxidants eat them up and the pro-oxidants are the bad actors. Now there's five categories. The first is called persisting organic pollutants known as POPs. The second is called solvent residues. This is things that are volatile, but they can get into your shower, into your water supply, into your food. There's toxic metals, geoisotopes. You remember Chernobyl and, and Fukushima and et cetera. So there's five categories. Um, the 21st century is a toxic century. You have to be proactive. You have to be um, uh, uh, vigilant about increasing the intake of the good stuff and very proactive to reduce the bad stuff. Because remember, okay. I started with 80% is, is recent, and you can reduce that. For example, take your shoes off just as you get into the house. 
That's a good have one. An, have have a have an OPA, HEPA, or molecular filter that cleans the air because half of the dust is skin that exfoliates because your body is excreting it. It's an excretory part of your body, like hair and skin and nails. <clears throat> and you want to not rebreathe that because very often, if your body is healthier, it will put the toxicants into the skin or the hair or the nails to get rid of them. Very smart of the body. So yeah. you want to remove that continuously by having something that cleans the air. And the indoor air is always worse than the outdoor air. As bad as the outdoor air is, the indoor air is actually always worse. So at least a HEPA, if not OPA, or the new what's called molecular air type of air cleaner, not just air filter. To me, that's a survival tool for the 21st century because it dramatically reduces my exposure. And I happen to live out in the woods where the trees and the flowers actually clean a bunch of the air, but mm -hmm. I live out in the woods by choice. Um, and want other people to be able to dramatically reduce their exposure to the um, protective nutrient consuming pro-oxidant categories we talked about by using nature, nurture, and wholeness. By eating foods they can easily digest, assimilate, and eliminate without immune burden. By eating in harmony with their nature, because it's about what you eat and drink, meaning stay well hydrated, it's also about what you think and do. So when you bring all of this together, you have a 21st century survival program that we call the joy of living the alkaline way. Love it. So uh, you were kind of actually breaking up a little bit. The, the connection was a little fading when you were going over the five different classes of toxic oh. that we're exposed to. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. But we got the pops we got yes, the, the pops. The, the pops are the persisting organic pollutants, right? The second. Could you give an example? Yeah. Could you give yes, like yeah, the, an example yes, or two yes, of these? Yes. Yes. When you hear about hormone disruptors, you're talking about these persisting organic pollutants. Everything from glyphosate, which is now becoming very accessible, too much consumed, and it does bad things. Accessible many, in a bad way. <laughs> yes. Too much in the diet. Yeah. People are exposed to far too much of something that they should not be exposed to at all. Yeah. And I and I can tell you how to dramatically reduce your exposure. Belong to a community supported agriculture, organic or biodynamic, what's called CSA. We do that. Excellent. We Excellent. happen to have in our front yard a seven year old permaculture biodynamic food forest. Come and visit and, and I'll show you how easy it is to maintain takes a little work to get started, but how easy it is for permaculture and biodynamics to allow you to be uh, able to eat from your front yard. Some, not, we, we're, we're not, not self-sufficient um, over there. No, no <laughs> by no means, by no means. It takes more yeah. than the little piece of land we have. But I but want the, people to know yeah. that you have the joy of getting shiitake mushrooms or portobello mushrooms by the bushel full twice a year. And wow. when they're fresh, they're really yummy. And, and if you, if you want to make a, a, a micro business out of it, you bring them to the Whole Foods market or the green grocer and, and you sell them for you know, reasonable amounts of money. So yeah. we, we are doing the things that are, uh, that are doable for us. Uh, as you know, I run an immunology lab that looks at these kinds of delayed sensitivity issues. Uh, uh, we have a leading nutrition for professionals a company called Perk Integrative Health. Um, we have a very promising hypertension candidate that's past phase two in the drug um, development world. Um, so I do this not just because I love it. I do this because it adds life to my years and years to my life. It turns out that gardening and dancing uh, and walking are about the three most health promoting things you can do. And, and, and laughter is right up there with them, by the way. So I'm a fan of, of uh, Patch Adams with his chakra therapy, which means laugh for five or more minutes a day. You, don't, you can put on Mel Brooks if you like that kind of satire, but it turns out you can laugh at nothing and still get the gut release of endorphins that are health promoting. 
so I've picked up a lot of pearls. I'm trying to convey them as you asked, which was, you know, to, to sprinkle them in. Yeah, um, thank you. And, yeah. And, 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 uh, and, and happy to amplify or clarify anything that I know. Excellent. I think that we already, you know, blasted, uh, blasted the audience with some great stuff. You know, one of which being, you know, that you focus on consuming food that is grown in a organic biodynamic way. Because I'm learning more recently that that's the food that heals the body. You know, food in the grocery store that's irradiated, that's, you know, deficient in minerals, um, grown in a monocrop sort of environment, that doesn't have medicine in it. And we know that food is medicine, but only if it's grown in a medicinal way. All all correct. All all correct. And you go back to Hippocrates, the father of Western medicine. Uh, who famously said, let your food be your medicine, medicine be your food. And more recently, I've forgotten whether it was Thomas Edison or Henry Ford, but some, someone who was a very successful business person uh, held that point of view. Mm-hmm. And there are healing systems, but they are generally what I would call matriarchal, experiential, and observation. And then there are diagnostic systems, which by analogy, I would say, are patriarchal, mechanistic, reductionistic, and therefore they exclude what to me is the heart and the art of medicine, of evoking human healing responses. There is what's called a nocebo effect, as well as what's called a placebo effect. Now, I don't use either term, but I do talk about evoking human healing responses, which is what I think the better part of the placebo meaning is. But there is a nocebo, if the doctor has a certain body language, has a certain attitude, has a certain uh, distance rather than uh, empathy, um, if the doctor speaks as if they're speaking ex cathedra rather than uh, identifying with the particular situation that this human being is in at that moment, it's a very different experience. So I think we can evoke healing responses while at the same time uh, taking in more of the good stuff that's the organic biodynamic, et cetera. Um, staying well hydrated, but hydrated with water that's not contaminated with something or other. Um, in my case, we fortunately have third aquifer well water, which is, I think, the first choice. The next choice is to get water in five gallon carboys, glass or hard plastic, from a deep min- mineral spring delivered to you however often you want them delivered to you. So there are what I will call inexpensive ways. And then, If you're affluent enough, you can have one of the traditional alkaline waters, Apollinaris, Garol Steiner, um, um, Pellegrino. Each cuisine, at least in the European world, uh, each cuisine is associated with an alkaline, what they call therapeutic water. Hmm. And why would you drink this water? Because it's mineral rich in magnesium and potassium and or zinc or lithium and or other trace minerals that your body needs a little of, but it needs a little of. And if you don't give it the little it needs, uh, now the team doesn't function well. Now the symphony is out of tune or or whatever analogy you'd you'd want to use. I think that a lot of people do get confused with regards to alkaline water, which might be a whole other conversation. And maybe we can just kind of scratch the surface and let me let me let me just give the headline. Let me just give the headline and hopefully you're right. We can come back with another conversation. A machine that makes alkaline water chemically should not be used because it's non-physiologic. And I said before, and you'll hear me say several times, physiology before pharmacology. The human body is alkalinized by only minerals, such as potassium, magnesium, etc. minerals, then short and medium chain fats like MCT, medium chain triglycerides are alkalinizing. Most fats are acidifying. You want the alkalinizing short and medium chain fats. And then the alkaline amino acids, alkaline amino acids like lysine and arginine and glutamine. And we have pioneered the recycled glutamine so that you can get the benefit of the symbiotic energy for intestinal repair without ever risking glutamate build up. So you want prebiotics, probiotics, and symbiotics. You want the good stuff coming in sufficient to keep the bad stuff from proliferating. 
as you talk, more and more questions build up, and I've got this backlog of questions now. So <laughs> I'm going to try to let it sift through. Um, but I want to kind of go back to the environmental toxicant, um, sure, you know, conversation. And just because we, like I said, it kind of broke up when you were explaining the five different categories, mm -hmm. which I think are important for people to grasp. The persistent organic pollutants being the right, the hormone disruptors. Pain. Those are the hormone pops. Disruptors. Those are the right. The hormone disruptors, the persisting pollutants, the pops. Second category is the solvent residues, methylene chloride, xylene, toluene. Solvents. Where do we find these things? Oh, the you find them. You find them yeah. in the water. You find them in the water. Because but where do they come from? While, oh, where do they come from? Oh, there's two sources, two major sources. Industrial. America's industry cannot uh, exist without millions of tons a year of xylene or toluene or orthotoluene or benzene, things that we know are harsh to your liver, are bad for your body. These are expressed into the air, then they come down in the rain to the groundwater, which is very often the source of water for people. People deserve to have water that's not contaminated, but most of what comes, to, comes into our house from the town or the city or the place that we live is gray water. In my opinion, it's gray water. Mm -hmm. What that means is you can boil it and then maybe use it for cooking, but you should add some quality sea salt, like Celtic sea salt, not Himalayan pink um, over-marketed and hyped salt, real mineralized salt with many trace minerals. And at our table, you get fresh ground black pepper, you get the choice of your sea salt, your Celtic sea salt, usually some other fresh herbs to go along with whatever we cook because we don't add salt while we're cooking. We add salt at the table. Great. It turns out that is better from your tongue's point of view. And I, my yes. tongue and I get along very well, I'm happy to tell you. <laughs> Um, and I think it is important to enjoy eating. Not, by the way, most of us are overfed and undernourished. Overfed and undernourished. But let's get back to these categories. So we had the first two. The third category is toxic metals. Now, toxic metals mean lead, mercury, cadmium, arsenic, nickel. And today, you can throw in a few others like beryllium, what have you. <clears throat> but toxic metals are exactly that. They work to deplete magnesium, to harm your kidneys, your liver, and very sensitive cells, very energetic cells in your body, are denervated, de-energized. You become tired easily or irritable easily when the lead, mercury, cadmium, nickel, arsenic begin to build up. Now, you have natural antitoxin mechanisms that we and others have validated and pioneered including with an acronym G-G-O-B-E. That stands for garlic, ginger, onions, brassica, sprouts, and eggs. G-G-O-B-E. Garlic, ginger, onions, brassica, sprouts, and eggs. These are the high sulfur foods. These are nature's detoxifying foods. Uh, these are the foods that Thomas Jefferson said should be staples of your diet, not condiments in your diet. Mm -hmm. And I'm a... <laughs> Grieving optimist like Thomas Jefferson. So these foods are staples in the diet just for the sulfur component to build up detoxification pathways and that sort of thing, correct? Yes, the, yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. <clears throat> the, uh, Dr. Alder, these are the biological detoxifying foods and we need them in abundance. We need them as staples in our diet. You don't need all of them. And if you're sensitive to one, then you avoid that one. But you've got five categories. Mm -hmm. And while all sprouts are good, Broccoli sprouts are best. While all eggs are good, I prefer goose and duck or quail rather than chicken eggs. But if you tell me it's a biodynamic chicken and it just laid the egg, I'm happy with that. But commercial yeah. eggs, commercial eggs, unfortunately, have dozens of categories one, two, and three. Sometimes correct. I was, I was that's where stuff. my yeah, that's right. where my mind went is that eggs okay. like they can be, yeah, a great uh -huh. source of sulfur, but maybe a source of all this other stuff. That's why I mentioned that I recommend, and you can get this at many markets today, get the duck eggs, get the goose eggs, get the quail eggs. 
or if you're like me and you don't like and you're just more fully plant-based vegan then um you know no no that's fine too if you're vegan if you're vegan we've got four we've got (laughs) got ginger onions and 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 sprouts right yes so so we're vegan friendly we're (laughs) plant-based friendly we're actually yeah. survival friendly. That's from my point of view. That's what it's I all about. I want to be dancing. Right. I want to be dancing at 120 and I want you with me because, you know, you want to have friends. So we got through heavy metals, which. Yes. Are- and then there's. And thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Then the fourth category is mold products. And it turns out the way the buildings are built today very often allows moisture to build up behind the walls and even a small amount of moisture can generate a large amount of mold, called black mold very often, yeah. or botrytis, botrytis, depending on which side of the pond you're from. But the point is, don't go there. Don't get exposed to it. If you are exposed to it, it is trouble on the hoof, both in terms of general malaise and impairments of your quality of life, as well as your respiratory health. Your restorative sleep will be less. There are many reasons to either Um, dry out the area and repair it, or if necessary, move. Because until you restore tolerance, your immune system is going to be hyper vigilant and you won't feel well. You're going to be in survival mode. You're not going to be in thrival repair mode. Energetically, your body is hunkering down because there's too much bad stuff and too little good stuff and you got to turn that around. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Mold and then the last one. Huge. And then yes. the mold is a mold is a growing problem. Yes. I'm old enough I think to all remember of when, growing when problems. Yeah. They, 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 you're, you're absolutely right. As my grandmother used to say, the rents are going up and the ceilings are coming down. <laughs> now the last category is radioisotopes, yeah. and from Chernobyl to Fukushima, and everywhere in between, there is today too much radioactivity in the environments. Now it's complicated and I'm certified up to uranium and they said, do you want to be certified for plutonium? And I said, only if I have to. <laughs> and how so I do is, understand, you, so I, I'm, yeah, so I yeah, do I'm understand curious. the issues. I do understand the issues. Now there are things that are relatively benign, like we call tritium, w- which is a very low energy emitter of radioactivity. In my day, we treated tritium like a special form of water because it is, it's a a radioactive form of water. Uh, On the other hand, what there's far too much of today are things that penetrate your body and one, one molecule of plutonium in the wrong place, one molecule of arsenic in the DNA in the wrong place. There are things that are such potent toxicants that one molecule in the wrong place is trouble waiting to happen. So I'm curious if you would put things like EMF exposure in this category as well, or what your thoughts are on EMFs. I know more people are talking about that these days. Very good question, and thanks for asking, because that might be the sixth category. There are certainly people who are sensitive, and there certainly seem to be people who are not sensitive. Um, There is a group called BEMS, the Bioelectromagnetic Society, I go back to Ross Adey, A-D-E-Y, Ross Adey, a giant in his time in engineering, National Academy of Sciences man. And he's the one who put cell phones up to the ears of rabbits and showed that the calcium magnesium flux in the brain of the rabbit was shifted just by holding a cell phone to the rabbit, from which he concluded that you shouldn't do that. Well, I I remember. now Now, for full disclosure, I use cell phones. I use yeah. them as safely as I can. I use the ones that seem to me to be safer and getting safer because every once in a while I get this note that it's now safer than it was before. Well, how safe was it that you have to now reassure me that it's safer than it used to be? Right. But I can't live without it. I don't depend on it. I think the later you get engaged with these screens, the better. My own children on Facebook, there's a photograph of my daughter and my son playing in the mud and the other side is two children who are friends of theirs looking at screens. And the caption is, Anna and Sky, my kids say, we're so glad we grew up in the mud. I am glad that I grew up more or less in the mud as well. I think that I'm kind of the last generation of mud children. 
Well, there's a yeah. movement under John it's Brown true. called there's it's a true. movement as a back there's a back to the wilderness, back to nature movement. It's called wilderness awareness under John uh, Young, uh, the Tracker School under Tom Brown, and other people like this are working with soldiers who have PTSD, are working with children who have ADHD, et cetera, et cetera, because there is much wisdom in mm -hmm. nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you, if, you, if you amble or ramble, nature will teach you. But be careful, because there's poison ivy, and then there's jewelweed. Jewelweed is the antidote to poison ivy. Um, I only know that because John Young used to come to our home and, and teach the kids so they could be safe in the woods. Great. So we definitely painted the picture of this world and uh, the exposures that we're all inevitably dealing with. You know, we, we, no one lives in a bubble. Everyone interfaces with all five or six of these categories every moment pretty much of every day. Yes, sir. So how do we mitigate this? What are your favorite ways or preferred ways of uh, approaching this from a mitigation protective right. standpoint without becoming neurotic because we know that right. neuroses can, can be counterproductive as well. No, no, absolutely. I'm very yeah. well uh, asked. And, <laughs> and, and here's my, here's my, here's, here's the personal answer. I generally take my shoes off at the door. I also take two or three deep breaths because even if someone else drove, there's a certain amount of stress of being in a vehicle. And I don't want to bring that into the vibe, the feeling of my home, which is my R&D center. It's where I live. And so I calm myself. And I've been at this for many years. I'm one of those people who's done more than 10,000 hours of meditation. And yes, they stuck me in an MRI machine and my brain did change. And not for the worse, apparently. <laughs> All right. Good to know. Um, yes. So, so um, just your approach to reducing the dust and the vibe, and including the EMF, of the outside world as you move into your sacred place called your home, your space. Then within that, the whole foods, and very often, for example, we'll take steel cut oats put them in water overnight with a little bit of uh, cinnamon and, and, and maybe some other uh, spices um, because in the morning they're pre, they're pre swollen, which means it's now very quick, as quick as making what are called rolled oats. Now rolled oats have been rolled to the point where imagine that they were accosted and robbed of whatever value they had. It's not far from the truth, by the way, whereas steel cut oats, starting with organic oats, are a very healthy food. Um, and there's, it's mostly McCann's. There's mostly one company that knows how to slice oats. They used to make swords for samurais and for the British uh, military. Oh, wow. uh, and when, yes, and when they, when they went out of the sword business, they went into the cutting oats business. <laughs> so <laughs> they did that? some good with the, with the blades. Yeah, no more slicing and dicing people, just oats. Got it. Right. So there are, yeah. there are lots of these, what I will call helpful hints and tricks, not just tricks. The, there, are the things that over, yeah, there are things that over uh, generations and millennia, and, and I have had the privilege of going around the world, looking at the people who live the longest in every different culture, in every different geography. Now, it turns out the Greek Mediterranean cuisine and the traditional Japanese cuisine have a lot to recommend them including the fact that people enjoy each other in the course of preparing and serving each other and consuming food and then laughing or, or enjoying each other's company as you sip upon something. And I think this is in vogue today. And you stop eating relatively early, but not just before going to bed. Right. So I go to bed relatively early because I'm like a farmer, early to bed, early to rise. Um, I like to get up when it's still quite dark. I have a few hours in the morning when I'm quiet and so is the world. And somehow it feels delicious to me to have that time to stretch, to meditate, to think about my folks who have passed on, to think about um, my, the people I'm mentoring, just to think. Because as Queen Wu, the acupuncturist who I studied with, 
he once said to me, you know, if you don't make time to think, you'll never think an original thought. And then I said, Queen, nothing's original. He said, who cares if you have a good press agent? He, uh, he, he was not just a Taoist priest. He was a good friend, a good cook. And, yeah. it, and acupuncture is not the first thing you're supposed to do. You take the pulses and then very often you give people some herbs and or some, some attitudinal realignment right. and then you can start needling them. So right. uh, fortunately, I had a very traditional seven year apprenticeship. Um, and some other time we'll talk about it, but most of my teachers were very traditional in the time that you were their apprentice. And then I tried to compress it into less time. So three years for my training of Western physicians. And I once said to Bhante, the Cambodian monk, can he teach a short Vipassana mindfulness course? He says, oh yes, only six months. I said, Bhante, six days is already a long commitment for most Western people. He said, that's part of your problem. <laughs> Yeah, it's so true. Oh my gosh. I mean, you know, in this podcast, for example, people tune in for five or 10 minutes and oh, well, on to the next, oh, on to the next. Um, but I think just it's a great reminder for anyone listening to just kind of slow down and smell the roses and yeah. be in and, the and moment. I, and, I, and, I, and, and, and I believe as we go through the conversation that there's enough information inspiration action you know a actionable in you know news you need to know and and, and solutions you can use that's I love where that i you, believe we yeah. specialize i love that you use uh information and inspiration because that's kind of our slogan at our alter health business and uh you know because i think that we don't need really any more information I mean, we need to interface. Well, we're actually, we're, we're actually drowning. We're actually drowning in information. And you're, exactly. You're profoundly correct in, in, in approaching it that way. The machines are getting smarter. The information, when, when I was a young doctor, information was doubling only every 20 years. Now in biomedicine, they say it's doubling less than four years, which means in the time you're trained, as a professional, you know, medical school, whether it's naturopathic or allopathic, <laughs> half of what you were taught is out of date by the time you're beginning to practice. Totally. And, and that's it, embarrassing. Yeah. And it takes, you know, my understanding at least, and you probably have a stronger connection with this given your scientific background more than clinic, clinical, but my understanding is it takes usually a decade or two for science to make its way into the educational system. Is that also a very good point. Thank you for yeah. making it so clearly. From bench to practice, from the time, quote, the validation occurs. Now, first you have to have the idea, then do the first experiment, then confirm that you can see it twice, then someone else has to make sure they can see it. And then you get to the point where someone gets an approval for a new medication or something like that, or a new biological or a device. Then you have to go out and teach the next generation of doctors, which might take at least a decade. So mm -hmm. in my day, in my day, you could not be an employee. You had to work for yourself and sign your own check, which meant no company could influence your behavior. Now, there were a few exceptions coroners, certain pathologists, uh, certain forensic uh, anthropologists. But most practitioners were sole or group practitioners who owned their own practice. And that went out in the late 70s and early 80s. It was called managed care. And unfortunately, the consequence of managed care is mangled care. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and almost everyone agrees it's siloed. Almost everyone agrees that it's not patient-centered as it ought to be, that it's not providing good value, it's not preventing people from suffering, it's not reducing the loss of lives, which we calculate at Health Studies Collegium at a minimum of an extra million deaths a year, half a million from the consequences and ravages of diabetes. And remember, diabetes kills and diabetes costs, but diabetes is a choice, a choice, a choice. And then a quarter of a million from nutritional deprivations overfed and undernourished, and then a quarter of a million from the stress of the healthcare system. Yeah. Healthcare in America is a privilege, it's not a right. It should be a right, because we, in our Declaration of Independence, it says we have the right to pursue happiness. 
I believe you can only pursue happiness if you're healthy. So I consider health a right, not a privilege. Um, and yet I know that if you tell me your socioeconomic status, I can predict how healthy you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, these, are, these are facts. These are good They're facts. facts. They're facts. Um, now, what are we going to yeah. do about them? We're talking yeah. about what to do in the 21st century to, to first know where you're strong and know where you have risks that you can do yeah. something about. That's called epigenetics. That's where these eight predictive biomarker tests come in. So I don't start out by identifying which of all the bad offenders is going uh, <coughs> most prominently for that individual. What I start with are these eight predictive biomarkers. And if you're at your best outcome goal value, I'll show you why to celebrate. And if yeah. you're not at your best outcome goal value, I'll show you what to do over three to six months to regain, you know, to add life to years and years to life. Yeah, we can we can sprinkle those eight predictive biomarkers on, but I wanna I wanna step back to the sure. <clears throat> mitigation of exposure oh, sure. to environmental toxicants. You talked about you know soaking your steel cut oats overnight, and I know that oats are of course a great source of fiber that is right. important for the detoxification process. So is that is that what you're? Well, yes. Basically, basically, oats are a good source of prebiotic fiber. And Roger Williams, among others, taught me and others that you need 40 to 100 grams a day of prebiotic fiber. And, the and, stand, most, and most average, Americans, yeah. yeah, most Americans get five to 10. Most yeah, Americans are woefully pathetic. deficient. Well, and, if you yeah. don't have to chew, if there's parts of your diet that you don't have to chew well, you're not getting enough fiber. So one way to enhance your fiber is through uh, steel cut oats. Um, and then you might wanna sprinkle into that something like what we call regularity guard, which is multiple prebiotic fibers that are instantly soluble in broth, uh, in water, uh, in soup, in oats, wherever. Um, mm -hmm. So you want to have more fiber in your diet. Then you wanna have more good bugs. Cause it turns out if you have enough probiotic healthy bugs, they crowd out the bad bugs. And now the pathogens and the parasites are manageable with enough fiber prebiotic, enough uh, healthy bugs probiotic, enough recycled glutamine symbiotic. And that's one piece of surviving the 21st century and staying healthy despite whatever else you're exposed to. So you, you mentioned a couple of times this recycled glutamine. Yep. I know that glutamine is an amino acid, of course, an amino acid that nourishes our enterocytes and our intestinal tract. Could you talk about the recycled nature yep. of glutamine? Yes, because this is something we pioneered. Now, yeah. glutamine is the energy source for the enterocytes, the, the very metabolically active cells that line the digestive tract. They divide very rapidly because they're very delicate. So they use glutamine to extract from the amine, glutamine, they extract the amine for energy. Now what we provide is called PAK, P-A-K, pyridoxal alpha ketoglutarate. Notice I said that all is one word, not B6, which is pyridoxine, and alpha ketoglutarate, which is a keto acid, pyridoxal alpha ketoglutarate, P-A-K. P-A-K picks up the amine and delivers it to a glutamate, because we want to reduce glutamate, we want to increase the functional energetic value of the glutamine. And that's what the pack does, on average tenfold. So now if you give one and a half grams of recycled glutamine on rising and before bed, amino acids on an empty stomach, so on rising and before bed, one and a half grams of the recycled glutamine with pack is equivalent to 15 grams of free glutamine, as Doug Wilmot or Judy Schabert would have you take. So you never build glutamate, you never imbalance the arginine to glutamine uh, physiology because you're constantly recycling and, and having the enterocytes benefit from this glutamine boost. So the recycled glutamine is a product that contains glutamine with this pack. Right. In so we have ultra pure. Makes the, right. We, we yeah, have, it makes right. the we glutamine pure, more bioavailable, essentially. Tenfold. Tenfold. Yeah. Tenfold. On average, ten times recycled. And we have had this in clinical use for decades. 
Yeah. Um, we have just many, many anecdotes that show that when you include the fiber and the good bugs, along with the symbiotic, along with the recycled gluten, then you get synergistic benefits rather than deterioration. It makes you a lot of repair. sense. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me considering that our, you know, in naturopathic medical school, we learned that health starts in our gut. And right. we know in this world that our gut is our interface with the outside world. And that's kind of our first line exposure to all these toxins, you know, potentially that we're talking about. So go, go back to Lindlar's Nature Cure yes. from the 1920s. Bonte yes. introduced me to that. No, I'm glad yeah. you know about it because, um, and for full disclosure, you know that I'm an MD, PhD. I'm, I'm a member of the American College of Physicians. I'm an American Medical Association member for full disclosure. But my message, and I think you've picked up on this, is classic yeah. naturopathic medicine. You, or right. maybe a We're on the same team. We're on, yeah, we're on no, the same absolutely. team. Absolutely. <laughs> and I want to bring us all together to save a million lives a year, to add a trillion dollars to the balance sheet of the country, to um, make sure that we do not induce suffering or that we reduce the suffering that people are under. Because today, a lot of people are leading lives of quiet desperation, which is someone mm -hmm. else's phrase. It's a classic phrase. But they are. And I want them to be uh, jumping out of, not jumping out of bed. I want them to stretch in bed for five minutes before they jump out of bed. But when they get <laughs> out of bed, I want them to feel as well as I do. And I'm old yeah. enough to say that after I stretch and when I get out of bed, I'm just very grateful for whatever the day has ahead because I feel that well. And yes, I do take supplements three, four, five times a day, depending on my preference and, and need. And I think that's essential. I don't think you can do it with diet alone. In the 19th century, good healthy diet, good healthy lifestyle, good healthy relationship, good for you. Uh, not in the 21st century. There's too much challenge. There's too much intoxication. There's too much distraction. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm glad you asked about the EMF because up until 5G, which is now the broadband high speed forever for brand, all our brand new stuff, yeah. yeah. Up until 5G, I was aware that there are people who are very uh, exquisitely sensitive and they should work with an environmental health specialist who usually is sensitive themselves and can help you find out where your place is not properly grounded or help you find out where your kind of power needs to be on a UPS, an uninterruptible power supply, a kind of battery in between what comes into the um, to where you live and, and, and what, what your circuits see. There's a lot to this subject, and very few people understand it. Um, but I did mention BEMS, the Bioelectromagnetic Society. Uh, there is a wonderful newsletter, and it is called Electromagnetic News. Electromagnetic News. And I'm trying to think at the moment of the editor, but this Schlesson, his name is, I think, Lou Schlesson, but the editor's name is Schlesson. And he has been providing, in my limited experience, the most accurate, timely information about the good, the bad, and the ugly in regard to EMF. And there are large parts of the spectrum that I believe have no resonance, no interaction with the human body, but then there are a whole bunch of parts that do. And I don't know if this is still true, but there was a time when microwave ovens came with a little plaque that says, if you have a cardiac pacemaker, don't stand within two feet of this device. Oh, wow. At the same time, those companies were claiming that there was no EMF coming out of the device. Well, how the hell did it stop pacemakers if there was nothing yeah. coming out? <clears throat> yeah, it's a, it's a great question. You know, the fact I'm, I'm aware of all these fine print, you know, things that no one reads and the iPhone and the computer and all these things. And someone pointed out, Hey, it's in there that you shouldn't hold that phone oh. against your head. You know? No, no, no. It's, it's actually yeah. very clear. The phone is supposed to be in a holster, at least a certain small distance away right. from you because it falls off as the cube of the distance. That's all correct. Mm. Yeah. Um, but you're absolutely correct. If you use the device the way they recommend, you'd be shouting into your hand most of the time. 
<laughs> well, you've got you've got your earbuds nowadays that you uh, can no use. wait no no yeah. no 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 no. It turns out the earbuds and the equivalents, the ones that have really radio transmitters in your ear. Now, you can there are the Wi-Fi where you just have a um, a resonator, but most of them actually have a little radio transmitter in the device in the AirPod. So oh, I well, do the have ones, AirPods. the ones that are wired that you're wearing now. They're they're more safe. No, no. Presume. Oh, no. The reason that I'm wearing what I'm wearing is because this is absolutely safe. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So I'm looking the at the device. Device. Yeah. Right. I'm looking at the device. I believe you can hear me. This provides quite decent audio. So I do have the other little thingies, the AirPods, um, and I will use them when necessary. I'm doing yeah, a commercial yeah, yeah. for them right now. Um, <laughs> I've got my own version here, which I'm not, I, think, I don't use all that often. But No, no. Yeah. That, that's my point. First of all, we're adults. If you're telling me that this is a pregnant woman or you're telling me this is a child who's going through a growth spurt, I will be much more cautious about how yeah, much exposure I think that's a great point. they have. On the other hand, my ears, because I check them once or twice a year, I'm glad to tell you that my ears are doing just fine. And, and I've had these devices as long as they've had devices. On the other hand, I use them for a very small function and I dismiss them. That is, I walk away from them. The one thing that I now have almost all the time is this watch that watches me. It tells me how many steps, and I oh, yeah. wanted to tell me my cardiogram is okay, but that hasn't happened yet. But I do think these biometric devices will bring to our attention the part of the lifestyle reminders that to me are an opportunity in the 21st century to make sure you get in, say, eight to 10,000 steps a day, just walk. It turns out it's a right. great exercise. And if you can amble, even better. You, know, you, don't have to, you don't have to speed walk. If you like right. speed walking, do the exercise you like. When yeah. people say to me, what exercise should I do? I say, what exercise do you like? And then they look mm -hmm. back at me like, I don't like to exercise. I said, well, how about just walking? How about gardening? You know, that's an exercise. Totally. So, no no yeah. gym required. Yeah, no so gym required. If you like gyms, yeah. that's fine. But if you like Sue, that's also fine. You don't have so, to go to a gym. So, um, you know, back to the food as medicine thing that I want to kind of, you know, hammer in and wrap up right. as best yep. we can. Um, yep. Beyond the, our sulfur-containing foods that you laid out, right. beyond the fiber-containing foods, the prebiotic, the probiotic, the symbiotic, I really like that. What other kind of mm. foods can we be focusing on for natural detoxification? Well, let me start with the premise that most of the people who need this information do not have strong digestion. If you have a strong, healthy digestion and constitution, you're exempt from what I'm going to say. And what I'm going to say is the hard to digest foods are grains, cow dairy, and meat. Therefore, Dr. Jaffe says, if you want to enhance, restore, uh, rehabilitate your digestive competence, have grasses, but no grains, which means no oats, because oats are a grain. Anything that's sticky, anything you can make a bread-like thing out of, has some kind of gluten. Now, wheat gluten and oat gluten, gluten and, and, and other barley gluten are each different, but they are hard, grains, hard to digest. So my suggestion, and you're asking me for a global suggestion, grasses are easy to digest, vegetables and fruits, herbs and nuts and seeds, fermented foods, um, fruits that are vine ripened to the extent possible, uh, locally grown uh, and engaged, which means you know the source. Yeah. I, I love what you're saying here because it's speaking to the fact that, you know, you heal the gut, you, you support the gut rather in healing itself, and right. then you naturally detoxify. Is that- Yes, sir. Safe yes. to say. So reduce the to... burden, yeah. reduce, re reduce the burden, reduce the input that you can do with what we talked about before, enhance your body's ability, your liver, your spleen, your kidneys ability to get the stuff out. And a lot of stuff actually comes out through our lungs or through our sweat or through our poop. So make sure that you have a healthy transit time. Make sure that after rest, your urine pH reflects enough minerals like magnesium. Make sure you're well hydrated. And there are self-tests that we have pioneered that are available online for each of these important fundamental categories of physiology. And when someone says, well, what do you mean physiology before pharmacology? I said healthy transit time, healthy hydration, 
healthy ascorbate based on the C cleanse, healthy urine pH to reflect alkaline minerals like magnesium, things like that. Excellent. Yeah, I know that you you've obviously got your your companies that you know one of which is diagnostic and one of which is supporting you know supplements and mitigating the problems that we're talking about here. So we'll certainly put information to learn more about the various products that are coming from your brilliant mind and brilliant, you know, so, uh, yeah, I think that yeah, thank you. Are- so you can, you, you can come through a professional whose guidance is really important, especially yeah. in the more complex cases, but many consumers today are working with a health coach an online health coach. And if that's what works, that's what works. Yeah. And we're in favor of whatever works. Whatever works. We, 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 want to evoke <laughs> healing, we want to evoke healing responses. We want to save a million lives a year. Yeah. So, um, you know, on the, we, we kind of, you mentioned the eight biomarkers, which right. I'd like to just kind of blast out real quick. We don't need to dive in and dissect any of them, but it's important maybe for people to ask their doctors, run these tests, or for clinicians that are listening to know how important these tests are. So what are these eight? Yeah, the the eight predictive biomarkers, the ones that cover all of epigenetic lifestyle, are hemoglobin A1c, high sensitivity C reactive protein, known as HSCRP, sometimes known as cardiac CRP, homocysteine, plasma homocysteine, LRA, the lymphocyte response assay for immune tolerance, urine pH after rest to reflect mineral status, vitamin D levels, omega-3 index, so that your essential fat balance is healthy. And the last is 8-oxoguanine. It's a urine test of DNA oxidative damage. And you want your DNA to have lots of antioxidants to help repair it. You do not want your 8-oxoguanine to be elevated, indicating cumulative mistakes and errors in the genetic code. Great. Yeah. I can certainly appreciate how much breadth and depth that this sort, these sort of tests can provide in terms of insights into what's going on inside our body. Yes. Sir. And the, the other, the other thing that I um, would love your insight on knowing that we're all obviously individualized, but do you see any supplements that would kind of be um, maybe if if you could slip a supplement, say, in the water supply to get everyone healthy, what supplement? Well, there are there are a number of there are a number of yeah. candidates. There are a number of candidates, uh, as you probably know. There's Albert St. Georgie who pointed out that ascorbate vitamin C in the natural form, fully buffered, fully reduced L ascorbate, is as important to survival as oxygen and sunlight well that's well, kind human, of important yeah and human beings and, are the one of the only anim, mammals that don't synthesize their own vitamin c correct so that's exactly correct so two million evolutionary years ago we lost the ability to convert sugar into ascorbate many sugar cravings are a lack of ascorbate when you do the c cleanse which we've pioneered to determine how much ascorbate antioxidant you need because of your total oxidative stress level when you do your C cleanse on a regular, like weekly basis, you find that you now can get ahead of the oxidative burden that is impairing the quality of your life. Wow. Yeah. So a sorbate, certainly a candidate, like you said. Right. Which is by so, vitamin so, C. So number one, uh, yeah, number, well, no, no, but I want to distinguish fully buffered, fully reduced well, ascorbate from yeah. vitamin C. When you get a bottle of vitamin C, it's synthetic. It's mostly oxidized. It is not what you think it is. It's as phony as a $3 bill. Don't do that. You <laughs> absolutely yeah, want, you. yeah, you absolutely want only fully buffered, fully reduced, 100% L-ascorbate, nature's vitamin C. And yes, Which is, which is what comes in food, correct? Oh, yes. That's, that's what's yeah. in food. It's just from food, you can get a couple of hundred milligrams. Most people need between a couple of thousand and many thousands of milligrams to deal with the oxidative burden of their current existence. Got it. So any other candidates that... Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There are several (laughs) right up there. There are several right up there. 
So ascorbatum polyphenolics are number one. Number two is magnesium, but the enhanced uptake magnesium with the benefit of choline citrate. Because magnesium deficit and choline deficit and citrate deficit are each so important that for the first time in the history of the military uh, of the United States, they're considering adding a supplement which will include magnesium and choline citrate. Because we're not getting enough of any of those. And the mm -hmm. cost, the cost to the society, the, co the cost to us as people is just far too great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would guess that also maybe some minerals. You were talking about well, miner you know, minerals. When, when the reason, the reason yeah. yes, but the reason that we measure the urine pH after rest is because then the bladder and the fluid, the urine, equilibrate. So once a day, just after six or more hours of rest, you have a measure of metabolic acidosis, you have a measure of adequacy or inadequacy of magnesium, and then we guide that you take the amount of magnesium you need, that you need, in order to restore your cellular magnesium. And by the way, you need one molecule of magnesium per ATP molecule to make the ATP work. Magnesium protects essential fats in transit as an antioxidant. It's nature's calcium channel blocker. It's also known as the forgotten electrolyte because until we enhance the uptake with the choline citrate, the maximum you could get in was one third of the dose. And if you push the dose, people would run to the bathroom with diarrhea and run away from you. Yeah. And, and we have now found how to enhance the uptake and more importantly, chaperone the delivery to the cells using the choline citrate. And it must be choline citrate, not choline bitartrate, not something else. Go try to fool mother nature and she won't be happy. Love it. Um, I, like I said in the beginning, I know we could go on and on for probably sure. <laughs> hours and hours. I do have kind of one final question here that um, I'm wondering, you know, th and this is obviously a whole nother conversation, but what, in your opinion, you know, if you could put a percentage on per se, how much does our mindset, our thoughts, our beliefs, our mental health, if you will, have to do with our healing in today's world? I would like to have that conversation. I'm going to give you some headlines right now, but the conversation yeah. is mind as healer, mind as slayer. It's a title of a book by Ken Pelletier friend and, and, and colleague. So if you know how to use your mind well and wisely, you can help heal yourself. But let me point out two obvious things. You cannot take 2B6 to equal a B12, and you cannot, you cannot meditate without physically moving. I, I can tell you from personal experience, I used to meditate and actively imagine myself doing exercise, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that, but you actually have to physically move your body around in order to get some benefit. So if you want to practice lucid dreaming, if you want to practice any of the men, many mind-body techniques that over millennia have been used by the healthiest people around, and I have had the great good fortune to study with some of them, every one of them will tell you that if you use your mind properly, it is your greatest ally. If you don't use your mind properly, it's your fault. That's what they say. That's great. <laughs> we, could, we could dive in for another. Oh, no, no. I would hour. love to have that conversation. Yeah. I'm not saying every yeah. day in every way you're better and better. I'm not talking about Pollyanna. I'm talking about how to discipline the drunken monkey mind, the drunken monkey mind, to become your ally in sustaining you, in evoking your healing response in helping guide you to your highest self. Because I think for each of us, we wanna be the best person we can be. I do, I think you do. I'm, I'm pretty sure the people who are your clients benefit from that approach. Okay, well, I think that's a great place to end um, because I also think that's a great place to start in terms of the healing journey. Thank you. So. Yeah, no, thank you. <laughs> So, Dr. Jaffe, it's been a real pleasure, and uh, thanks for sharing as much. I mean, we kind of took a shotgun and just blew a lot of things out of here, but I think it hey. things will land in a good way. So, thank you, thank yes, you. Sir. Yes, and, take care. And peace and love, and until next time. And to you. Thank you.